Hi everybody, this recorded lecture is for Friday the 22nd of April, so this is the last class of the semester, class number 40. Um, let's just go over a couple of announcements. Obviously this class is online, and uh, since you may be watching this before the homework, homework due date and deadline, I'll just remind you that homework 13 should be uploaded to Blackboard before 5 o'clock on Friday the 22nd. Um, so a week from Friday the 22nd is when we have our final exam. It's on the 29th. That's the last day of finals and in fact our final is going to be during that last time slot. So the last final on the last day. We're going through it to the very bitter end. Um, our exam is from 1245 to 245 and uh, I'm going to be writing this exam to be more lengthy than the previous ones where we only had about 50 minutes. So this will be you know, approximately twice as long. Um, the exam is comprehensive, meaning that you should review all of the material through the whole semester. You might see some closed conduit flow questions, as well as the more recent open channel flow stuff that we've been doing. Um, proportionally, more of the points will come from the later material since you haven't, you haven't yet had an exam on that. Uh, but there will be questions scattered throughout the topics of the entire semester. Um, you ought to bring your computer with you so that you can have access to Excel. There are a lot of our numerical calculation techniques that use Excel. And also you should have access to WaterGems. WaterGems is the software that you used for the design project. And uh, I may um, put together a question to give you the opportunity to demonstrate your proficiency on the final. So please have access to both for the final exam. Uh, you can bring three pages of notes if you like, but I don't think that's necessary uh, that you do. I'll still be providing the usual equation packet that I always do, but you can put anything you like on those notes. It can be outlines of calculation procedures where there's an Excel method that you're using. It can be formulas uh, written the way that you prefer it. It can be variable definitions, just basically anything that you like. Um, there won't be any conceptual questions or short answer type stuff on this hydraulics exam. Um, but uh, if you do have any questions about the conditions of the test, just let me know. I, I plan that we will have discussed it on Wednesday as well. Um, the remainder of this lecture is related to sewer design, and so concepts and uh, calculation principles from this part of the lecture, class 40, could be included as fair game on the final exam, so I hope that you'll pay good attention to this. Uh, the recording from the um, from the lecture has come from a previous semester, but all of the material remains the same, and there's some examples in here that I hope that you'll pause the recording and work through when it comes to that. So let's get into it. All right. So what we're looking at today is uh, channels to convey flow. And I've tried to give you a little bit of an idea of what would be in hydrology, that uh, elective class for the fall. but. You know, all semester long, we've just been given a flow rate Q that we're trying to evaluate what happens when you've got this certain amount of water going through a channel. Uh, but today, we're going to be shifting gears and doing designing, where you're given a Q, and rather than just assessing what is the depth, you're trying to say how, wa how wide or uh, uh, how deep the channel needs to be in order to convey the flow. Now, the hydrology side of things is the calculations required to estimate what the flow rate's going to be for a certain storm. Uh, but today we're going to look at uh, the difference between concrete lined channels like this. Uh, this is an irrigation canal that um, is you know, man-made and very smooth, uh, likely to lose less water due to infiltration down through the soil than a grass lined channel. Now, of the two, this grass line channel obviously cost a lot less money to put in. And which one to go for depends on more factors than just uh, what's your budget. It may be that sometimes we consider water as a waste and we want to promote infiltration. So if it's stormwater runoff, then we'd much rather have the water infiltrating into the soil than we would have it concentrating at some central location where then we have to build a pond or be concerned about flooding. But in this case, most likely what we're looking at is an irrigation canal where avoiding infiltration is really important because every drop of water that you lose to infiltration is a drop less that you have available to use downstream for watering plants. Um, 
Somewhere in between, in terms of making a channel that's more scour resistant, would be to use riprap. And this is showing water coming out of a culvert, and then these uh, broken up cobblestone rocks here. That's sometimes called riprap. And it's just to provide an armor to try and prevent the uh, scour of the soil that's underneath that um, rock lining. And uh, sometimes we even just will leave a channel as earth lined. And, you know, the Ohio River is an example of a natural channel that is lined by earth. And the shape of an earth lined channel is limited to the cohesive strength of the, of the soil. And uh, at the end of today's class, we're going to be talking about the angle of repose, that naturally soil has a, an angle of stability that it can make with itself related to the soil grain characteristics. And um, so it's an important uh, thing that we have to consider the velocity of the water moving through an earth line channel and compare that to how strong and how cohesive the soil is to, to resist the, um, the shear force that's being applied. So there's a lot of um, factors that a hydraulic designer will juggle beyond just the economic cost of what lining to put in. It's uh, sometimes infiltration is good, sometimes it's bad. We have to consider what's the velocity likely to be and uh, how concerned we'd need to be uh, with scour of the material and what is the slope of the ground. And a lot of the, thing, the things that are important can't be changed and slope is chief among those. You can't make a channel any steeper than it naturally is. You can actually make a channel less steep by meandering, but you can't make it steeper than the natural uh, surrounding ground. Otherwise, the river or channel will keep getting deeper and deeper. Uh, here's a picture of a canal in Florida. And if you've ever been down to Florida, you may have, as you're flying over, noticed that they have all sorts of drainage canals that are uh, really a scar on the landscape. They're, they're unsightly, but I guess it's better than living in a swamp. So they serve a purpose, that's for sure. Um, the channel design has to match the intended use. And uh, so that goes back to the idea of whether water is a resource or a waste, and whether you're trying to preserve it or if you'd be just as happy to have the water infiltrate into the ground. And also the expected velocities that you can uh, you can see in the channel and how that relates to whether armoring has to be provided. Um, so as engineers, we're always trying to optimize, and you remember that from the project, that you were trying to make the pipe sizes as small as possible. And in open channel, it's some of the same idea. We want to minimize the flow area. The reason why you want to minimize the flow area is that's what has to be excavated. You want to excavate as little material as possible subject to other factors that also contribute to the cost. But remember, we've talked, I'm not going to use this marker today. They fooled me already. I brought my own. We've talked about that if you had a very shallow, wide channel, that there would be a lot of resistance. And so you may be able to get the same flow capacity with a deeper channel, but has a lower cross-sectional area, simply because in this sketch on the left, there's a lot more uh, resistance along that wetted perimeter that's close to the flow area. Whereas the zones that are further away from the wetted perimeter aren't as inhibited by shear stress and so that the flow conveys more quickly. So minimizing flow area is your most efficient way to convey a lot of cue without having to excavate a lot of fill. And excavation is one of the primary costs related to constructing a channel. It's not the only cost, though. Uh, so we can rearrange Manning's equation in terms of A. And if you want to have a small A on Manning's equation, then the way to do that is to have a low flow rate. But normally, we can't control that directly. I mean, there are indirect ways to control the flow rate. If you think about a, um, a ditch that's conveying stormwater, you're going to have to convey more stormwater depending on what's built in the watershed. Uh, like a, uh, what's that, uh, what's the development called where Target is in Barbersville? What's its station? The Merritt's Creek. Yeah, yeah, okay. So Merritt's Creek, think about, if you've ever been up there before, it's just 
acres and acres of roof and pavement. There's lots and lots of impervious area where previously there was trees and uh, leaves and vegetation and just a lot of things that were absorbing water and promoting infiltration into the ground. And so when they switched from the natural undisturbed land cover to a uh, impervious surface, then that's going to greatly increase the amount of runoff there is during a storm. So that's an example of how you can indirectly um, adjust the flow rate that has to be accommodated. And uh, here in Huntington, they've started to adopt stormwater ordinances that require um, new construction to, to trap water underground. And the new practice facility is an example of where they have some underground uh, um, water storage under the parking lot. Um, and uh, I think if you look at the parking lot at Cookout, they've got kind of like a, um, asphalt there that is a pervious, pervious pavement. It, it's not real durable. It doesn't hold up well, but it does promote infiltration. So those are some ways to kind of shape upstream how much flow is going to have to be accommodated. What we do have control over more directly than that is the, uh, the end value because that's related to the material of what's being used for construction. Uh, the wetted perimeter, remember, we want to minimize the wetted perimeter in order to minimize the cross-sectional area. And then the slope. You can't increase the slope, but you could, if you wanted, decrease the slope by having uh, the stream go back and forth, back and forth between two points. If you have a meandering stream, that inc increases the, uh, the length. And so remember, slope is delta H over length. Delta H would be the elevation dis difference between two points. And so if you have a really long flow path, like is the case in a meandering stream, then that decreases the slope. <clears throat> so we want to minimize the flow area. Now, on the basis of shape, the best trapezoidal channel is one that looks like this. And here, the side slope, where 1 is the vertical and M is the horizontal component. You notice here, M of uh, square root of 3 divided by 3 means that you're actually going to have a uh, side slope that's steeper than a 1 to 1 ratio. So the best trapezoidal channel is really hard to achieve with an unlined material. Like, uh, you can't do it with sand or clay. Uh, you can do the best trapezoidal channel if you're using um, concrete material or uh, if you were um, blasting through rock, as occasionally happens. But, um, you know, it's the best uh, efficiency for a trapezoidal channel is a side slope that's kind of uh, difficult to achieve because it's so steep. Um, I want to point out one other note on this drawing, and that is freeboard. We'll talk about channel design and how you have to calculate freeboard in a minute, but you would want to provide a little overhead, a little extra flow capacity in a trapezoidal channel because, you know, for one thing, you might have more flow than you originally expected, but then on top of that, this additional freeboard gives your channel capacity for any wind-driven waves. Like if you've got a windy day and it was all the way to the top, then the water could spill out of the channel simply because it's a windy day or splashing, uh, or um, you know, waves that are related to maybe a hydraulic jump upstream or downstream. So here are the geometric parameters for the best trapezoidal channel. Wetted perimeter, the bottom width, the cross-sectional area, and the side slope. Um, so we've talked about freeboard already. Now the natural materials don't really allow a side slope this steep. Um, and so because of the cost of putting in a concrete lining, you know, concrete lining would keep the soil in place so you could have it that steep, but it's cheaper to just not use concrete and have a normal earth lining and make the channel a little bit wider. And so what we're saying is if you made it a one to two slope where two is the uh, horizontal and one is the vertical, you're going to be excavating more area, sure, but the excavation costs of that additional area would be cheaper, ultimately, in most cases, than uh, lining the channel. 
unless you had some other reason to line the channel, like that water is so precious you want to prevent the infiltration. Um, and there can also be other factors that contribute to ec other economic factors that have to be considered, like uh, sometimes there's not some place good to put the excess uh, excavated soil. There's no place to get rid of it. Or if the real estate is particularly expensive, a trapezoidal channel that has one to two side slopes is going to be much wider than the channel that's shown here. And so if you're in a high value neighborhood where uh, paying for the excess right of way is going to be prohibitively expensive, then that's another case where maybe it would just be cheaper to line the channel with concrete rather than paying for the extra channel width. So we've talked about the trapezoidal best shape. Um, the most, if, most hydraulically efficient rectangular channel is one that's a half square. Most uh, if hydraulically efficient triangle is also a half square, but it's turned on its edge. So it would look like a uh, half square like this. So the triangular, we wouldn't see the top at all. All right. There's two channel slopes that we have to uh, distinguish between. One is the, the longitudinal slopes. That's the slope that the water is flowing in that direction. Um, if you have a really shallow slope, then the water is going to move with a low velocity. It will give greater depths. And one of the things that we have to be checking on is uh, minimum velocity. Why was minimum velocity important in sewers? Sediment buildup. So the same thing is going to be something we check on here in open channels. Are particles settling down to the bottom of the channel? But there's an additional concern as well. Uh, in sewers, since there's no light underground, we don't have to worry uh, about weeds growing. But in an open channel, there is the possibility that a really slow-moving water would allow um, unwanted plants to begin to grow. And then there's a whole lot of maintenance that goes into mowing the grass that can grow in the channel and keeping cattails at bay, and uh, especially in water bodies that have lots of nutrients in it, like nitrogen and phosphorus, then the vegetative growth can really get out of control. So we're going to do a minimum velocity check to see if it meets some threshold to prevent, um, to prevent uh, sedimentation and vegetation. Uh, really steep slopes, though, which are going to avoid sedimentation and avoid um, vegetative growth, they can scour the material depending on what it is. So we have maximum velocity constraints as well. Um, so here are some like typical side slopes. Now those were all about longitudinal slopes. The side slopes that we're talking about are these ones, the, the side slopes. You can't the longitudinal slope is in the direction of flow, so into the page. But the side slopes are governed by the material. And so here are some side slopes that can be achieved with different types of uh, earth. So for a loose sandy earth, for, a, for instance, you could have two horizontal to one vertical, and it would be kind of like a sustainable shape. Um, in the case of rock, it could be nearly vertical. You, know, you could have a rectangular channel if you wanted to chisel into the rock and if it's stable you know, w without fractures in it and all the shapes in between. Freeboard that we've talked about, that excess capacity at the top of the channel also is useful when a channel has to go around a bend. Because just like when you go around a bend in your car and everyone sort of goes to the outside edge, you know, the opposite direction of the acceleration. You remember uh, in fluid mechanics we talked about uh, when a tank of water is acceler accelerated to the right, then the water will increase on the left. So if you have water going around a curve, the water levels can increase in one direction and decrease in the other. So freeboard is also useful because super elevation occurs. Um, let me show you. Super elevation, see this new water surface here, the blue line. This would be if we had a curve that was going around towards the right. Then the water level would increase to the left, decrease to the right, and the overall distance of the super elevation can be calculated according to this formula. 
H sub S would be the total difference in elevation between the left side and the right side. So it's calculated by the, uh, the velocity squared times the top width of the channel divided by gravitational constant and then the radius of curvature from the center line of the channel out to what the channel is curving around if it's following kind of like a circular curve. Now, um, freeboard is usually calculated just with kind of a, an empirical rule of thumb, 0.55 times the square root of C times Y. And C is, I don't know, kind of like a meaningless coefficient that just has been developed over observation and uh, we can linearly interpolate between a low flow rate condition where you need relatively less freeboard and bigger channels, we'd say you need a little more freeboard. And so in an example we're going to be working in a moment, what we'll do is we'll linearly interpolate the C value. And the way to do that is uh, if we look at it graphically, it's the, the C value is going to be on the vertical axis. So it varies from 1.5 to 2.5. And then on the horizontal axis would be the flow rate, where at the lower end it's uh, 0.57 cubic meters per second. And then up the upper scale it is 85 cubic meters per second. And so you just linearly interpolate between the two. And so the slope of this line, the, uh, the delta C divided by delta Q, would be 2 point, oh, that says 2.3, it should be 2.5. Okay, so 2.5 minus 2.1.5. And then the delta Q, 85 minus 0 0.57. And so when you get the slope of this line, you would multiply that slope by however much extra capacity above 0.57 cubic meters per second you're carrying and then add it to 1.5. So just standard linear interpolation. You know, C is going to be 1.5 plus some amount, something minus 1. Point, uh, will be the actual flow rate that you're seeing minus 0 0.57 multiplied by um, the slope of the line. So we'll get to that in a minute. But what you need to check at the end is making sure that the freeboard that you've established, that extra height above where the water surface exists, where the water surface is expected to be, you need to make sure that at least the uh, freeboard is greater than the expected uh, super elevation height. Now, line channels um, are nice because it allows you to get away with increased velocities, decreasing seepage, and they last longer. It's less likely to have uh, the channel um, threatening homes that are near the stream banks. And just right across from my house where I live, my neighbor has a really nice garage. And in the years since I've lived on in that location, the stream has basically scoured away about half the distance between the stream and his garage. Every year, the channel is getting closer and closer to his garage. And he knows it. He, he's planning to uh, try and put in some concrete lining and um, you know, he, he doesn't want his garage to fall into the river. And so if only the channel could be lined, then he wouldn't have that problem. Uh, the, the procedure for designing a lined channel is to check and see what material you have available to, uh, to define the end value in the second step and identify the flow rate to be carried. And that's not always a simple process because all hydraulic systems are going to eventually fail. It's just a matter of um, how frequently do you want them to fail. In other words, if you're putting a culvert in someplace at the bottom of your driveway, for example, um, 
there's eventually going to be a storm that is too big to be accommodated by the capacity of that culvert. It's just how often do you want the water to be flowing over the culvert instead of through it? Can you tolerate that culvert failing every five years, every 10 years? Now, sometimes the, uh, the design storm is specified by like a federal statute. In the case of interstates, the hydraulic systems that are associated with interstate freeways are supposed to be big enough that they can handle um, the 100 year storm. But um, not all municipal hydraulic, you know, not all municipal drainage networks are that robust uh, because I guess the stakes aren't as high. In the case of an interstate, people are driving 70 miles an hour, so if there's a lot of water coming in uh, to, the, to the travel lanes, then people are going to have a much more serious accident than, oh, well, people sometimes drive 70 miles an hour on Third Avenue here, but they shouldn't be in theory. So it would be less risky if the water's getting into the travel lanes here. So uh, anyways, identifying the flow rate to be carried, in the case of today's example, that is to be given to you directly, but in other cases, that's both uh, a hydrology question and uh, a regulation question of uh, how much water do we have to get out of the system that's going to be drained. Uh, we'll be calculating the normal depth with Manning's equation and then checking velocity for requirements related to uh, vegetative growth and sedimentation. All right, so here's the example that we're going to work. This is a channel that we've decided on reinforced concrete where we expect the end value to be 0.015. We want to be the best trapezoidal channel, meaning it should have that side slope that is a little bit steeper than a one to one ratio. And so in the best trapezoidal channel, here are the uh, characteristics, the cross-sectional area, wetted perimeter, trapezoid, and so on, as a function of depth. Okay, so the slope is given, and then we're going to have to check on the super elevation height at the end. And so the uh, turn radius here is uh, given as 5 meters. So you'll use that as the RC, the radius of curvature, when we uh, solve this channel. So the steps are numbered. We want to find out how deep the water is going to be. We're going to find out what's the velocity like at this design condition. And then uh, also make sure that whatever freeboard above and beyond the flow depth we pick is large enough for the super elevation height. All right, so calculating the C value is really just kind of a preliminary thing. Up till now, we haven't done any real hydraulic calculations. We just said, well, it's concrete, so N is 0.0. 0.015, we're finding the C value that we're going to use later on. But when it comes to uh, finding the normal depth, you have to say, all right, well, it's, we're going for the best. And so the best, the cross-sectional area is 1.73 times whatever the depth is squared. And then the wetted perimeter is 3.46 times Y, which is whatever the flow depth is. So you're going to substitute that into Manning's equation for A and for P. And so everything will be known. The Q will be known, N, slope. The only unknown at that point will be the depth, Y. And you need to solve for the depth once you substitute those things into Manning's equation. So get to that point, and I'm curious to know what depth you get. Hopefully it matches the one that I calculated earlier. All right, so we got the normal depth point 0.751 meters. And since we're trying to find the velocity, you can use that normal depth to find the area uh, with these. So having the cross-sectional area calculated will allow us to find the velocity. It should be about 2.46 meters per second. And then we check that to the criteria, 2.46. Where does that put things? Well, for one thing, 
if we had a non-reinforced lining, we'd be in trouble because that's a relatively high velocity. Uh, so it's a good thing that this is reinforced concrete because otherwise we'd be exceeding that limit of 2.1. But it's high enough that we should expect that the sediment, whatever sediment's in the water, is going to continue to be entrained. Uh, you know, it's moving along at a fast enough velocity that the particles won't settle. So the mixing is going to keep all those particles suspended. Uh, and also, it's moving fast enough that it pushes plants over, that they can't really establish a good root zone. So it's going to prevent vegetative growth, although you know, won't, uh, I guess limit would be more realistic. It's not going to prevent it because you know, plants will find a way to grow, but uh, they're not going to grow as well as they would if the velocity was slower. So things are looking good for the velocity. The last thing, calculate the freeboard and then see where things are at with the super elevation. Okay, so the freeboard, we want to, the depth of flow is going to be 0.751 meters. And then on top of that vertical height, there should be an additional 0.588 meters of additional elevation that is for the wind-driven waves and the super elevation and a little extra capacity and so on, splashing. Um, the super elevation, if you calculate that, is 0.214 meters. And just to go back to the drawing of what that means, that is, it's going to go up on one side and down on the other. So it's not that it's going uh, up just in one, it's not going up the full amount, it's only going up half the amount because here you can see from the sketch of the super elevation that if it's going up on one side, it has to come down on the other. And so the super elevation measures the uh, overall distance, vertical distance between those two extremes. So we'll have pr plenty of freeboard. Um, you'd really have to have fast moving water, high velocity, and a narrow radius of curvature in order to uh, have super elevation that gets more than the freeboard. Any questions that you wanted to ask about? Should I switch back to the solution one more time? Any questions on this? Okay, that's channel design. Um, things are a little bit different when it comes to unlined channels because we have to worry about the cohesive strength of the material that the channel is being built on. And so uh, the way that we do that is calculate the shear stress on the bottom of the channel. And we've seen this formula before where it's a function of the slope of the energy grade line. If we have um, uniform flow, then the slope of the energy grade line is parallel to the slope of the channel, which is parallel to the water slope. And so we can just put in whatever the, the downhill slope is and calculate the shear stress. Um, the shear stress on the sides of the channel are going to be a little bit different depending on the angle that the channel sides are built at. And so you'd use the contact angle to calculate the side shear stress. Now here's a good diagram that shows the angle of repose. If, if you've ever seen uh, sand being piled up maybe from a conveyor, you'll know that it, it forms kind of a natural angle and it can't be steeper than that simply because of the material properties. The angularity of the sand has a function. Uh, the moisture content has a function as well. But here is some typical angles of repose for different particle sizes and how angular and jagged the particles are, the more angular they are, and if the, uh, the particles are round, then they tend to roll off of each other, and so there's a lower angle of repose as compared to angular, misshapen, non-spherical particles that kind of interlock and lead to a higher angle of repose. Um, so we have to bring in the geotechnical engineer to to describe the soil characteristics when we're line, doing an unlined channel design. And uh, besides that, though, the procedures are largely the same, where you're trying to minimize the excavation area because that can contribute to cost. You're concerned about uh, the potential for scour, but then at the other extreme, low velocities, you're also concerned about sedimentation and um, plants growing. And this time, the plants are going to grow better than in a lined channel because for a lined channel, they'll usually only grow in seams in the concrete. Uh, but in an unlined channel, they can grow all over the banks. 
And there are little uh, boats that are designed simply to mow vegetation that grows in, uh, in channels. And this is pretty common in Louisiana where uh, the water is moving very slowly in some of the backwater areas that have very shallow slopes. And so there's heavy nutrient loading there and the plants grow prolifically. And so uh, barges have to go through these channels that are supposed to be navigable. Uh, barges will have to go and mow down the weeds several times uh, during a season. So again, the, the velocity can give us an idea of how well vegetation is going to grow. Um, so channels are sometimes built in grassy areas. Rather than having an unlined channel just like strict soil, one of the, one of the ways to prevent scour is to put uh, a grass lining. And then the other advantage of having a grass lining is that it also can um, help to promote infiltration if the water is kind of uh, considered waste. And so along the uh, side of roads, oftentimes in, in channels that are meant to convey stormwater, they'll, they'll uh, have grass grow. And uh, what I'm showing you right now is a table of retardants class. And this retardants class is related to the resistance that, wa that um, these grasses um, provide for water that's flowing, uh, that's flowing along it. And so the retardants class, if you, if you know what kind of, which species of grass you have, and then product of velocity and the hydraulic radius, then the Manning's end can be looked up off of a table like this. And so what's important for you to understand is that Manning's end value is variable for grasses. And so as the grass I'm sorry, as the velocity times the hydraulic radius goes up, the end value goes down. So let me do a little sketch of grass to illustrate what's happening here. Here's a normal channel, and let's say we've got a grass-lined channel. All right. Those lines represent grass. All right? I think you get the point. That's nice, right? So the water is going this way. Why is it that Increasing velocity, do you suppose, decreases the end value. It pushes the grass over. Exactly. So the, when we talk about roughness elements earlier in the semester, you know, we'd say that if you've got um, the, the whatever it is, it can be steel, it can be concrete. We talked about equivalent sand diameter. If it's projecting into the flow, um, into the flow field, then there's a higher amount of resistance. Well, as the grass gets pushed over, then the end value decreases. And so the first thing you do is you look at the retardants class. And so things that have a high level of resistance, these A class, the A class uh, plants, weeping love grass. I don't even know what that is. But I've heard of kudzu before. We've got kudzu in West Virginia. And it, a lot of it grows if you go out on the way towards um, Fayetteville, you see loads of it. Lots of resistance, kudzu. Um, Bermuda, on the other hand, not a lot of resistance there. Burned stubble, Bermuda grass, that sounds like my lawn. <laughs> burned stu the burned stubble part, anyway. <laughs> uh, and then down here, it's if this is an, an excellent stand, meaning it's in good condition, versus like, do you have patches of uh, bare soil? So excellent stand versus good stand, unmowed. So it's, it's not just the space. Yeah. It may. All right. So uh, these grass line channels are desirable because it helps to prevent scour that would otherwise occur if it was just bare soil promotes infiltration, and it's aesthetically pleasing. It's nice to drive along a road that has a grassy ditch compared to if it's just a, a, a ditch with dirt in it. But then on the disadvantage is that the grass has to be mowed. Otherwise, it's going to reduce the flow capacity of the channel. If you have a lot of weeds projecting into the, uh, into the channel, that's going to increase the end value, decrease the flow area. So it's all about maintenance in a lot of cases. Uh, 
We're getting awfully close. This is the last slide of the semester here. I wish I could say we're ending with a bang, but this is kind of just a pedestrian table of uh, suggested maximum velocities depending on what the material is. So let's really draw this out. We've got another six minutes to spend on this slide. If you've got rock, the water can flow 20 feet per second over rock. That's good. Good rock. So we're talking like your ACDC, Leonard Skinner. Okay. Poor rock is a uh, uh, poor rock. What would that be? In Boston. Uh, no, actually, I like Boston. I don't know why I said that. No, Van Halen would be poor rock. Literally, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Now you'll remember the term, right? So, maximum velocity is a function of the material that you use for obvious reasons because sand is going to be washed away more easily than clays will. Clays are cohesive. And then uh, different types of grass can resist different velocities. And we said that above 2.4, it should be reinforced lining. And here's a little bit finer look at that. If you have, uh, I guess there's a type of grass called smooth brome. So 1.5 meters per second will be erosion resistant soil level.